Welcome to episode number 109 of This Week in Location-Based Marketing, recorded December 21st, 2012. On today's show, news from Placecast, Facebook, Foursquare, Grokker, Senseware, Shopular, Chase Bank, Urban Compass, and Tappet Media, plus Mommy, Google's Santa Claus, and special guest Patrick Reynolds of Triton Digital. Oh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 109 of This Week in Location-Based Marketing. Oh, you know what I just realized? Let's see if I should have put on my sand over there. I should have lit the Santa. It's Christmas Eve. That's when you guys will be uh, watching. Yes. Merry Christmas to you, yes. Rob, and your family. Well, this is this is the last episode before Christmas, obviously, because it is Christmas Eve if you're watching this right now. Uh, and it is episode number 109. Um, and uh, wow, what a way to end the year, Asif. Uh, my name, Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv. And, uh, you know, what can I say? To, I'm snowed in today. I can't tell you. We've had like 18 or 19 inches of snow. Asif, is it like that in Toronto? We, we have zero snow. It's green as, as as you could ever imagine. It's raining. It's it's something like uh, what I would imagine if I was in like Portland, Oregon, or something today. That's you know that's what it's like. It's green. It's as green as it can be. Like it's it's ridiculous. Well, so, literally, like you know, basically, we've had I've I've shoveled twice today. We've had eighteen inches of snow, and it's still coming down. Still coming down, and it's heavy snow. Like it's like it's it's beautiful snow. Like it's one of those times you wake up and it's like ah, oh, God, this is the yeah, well, I love winter. I don't think we're having a white Christmas in Toronto. So well, that sucks because uh, you. Well, I'll send some over just for you, just for you. But uh, yeah, that'd be good. Appreciate that. So Asif from the LBMA, the LBMA dot com at the LBMA on the Twitter sphere. We got a good show. We don't have any announcements. Asif is in the city. He's not doing any events. You know, except for waiting for uh, Santa Claus to come chasing down his chimney. Uh, this is going to be a great show, a great show. I want to remind everybody that over the next couple of weeks, the schedule doesn't change. We're still publishing on Monday. So the next episode will be uh, New Year's Eve. It will be our prediction show. It will not feature a guest. There will be no news. It will be a summary, a recap of what went on in this year in location-based marketing, plus what we think is going to happen in the coming year. That's 2013. And then we, we will be back with our regularly scheduled show uh, with guests and news uh, on January 7th. That's that's about right, right, Asif? That's you got it. Bang we on. will be so that will be episode number one hundred and eleven. We'll be back to our regular show, but I, I, I implore you, do not miss the predictions show. Asif and I have been wrong every time, and this is the one that we finally are going to be. Right. No, I'm just joking. We we we, <laughs> we do pretty well. We, yeah. Well, we got to be right sometime. We do. We do. And I think that this is going to be a contentious one because uh, the, the tide has turned in this industry. You're going to see some of the news items that we pulled up today, which are, is exactly that. We're going to start to see some some huge plays, I think, by some of the incumbents, like we talked about last year. But this is implementation now. So we'll leave it till next week. But please tune in. And please have yourself a very merry and safe Christmas going forward. All right, so why don't we? We're just going to get into this. Like, why waste any time? We got so much to talk about. Uh, are you are you keen on this, Asif? Uh, I'm, I'm ready to roll. I mean, there's there's a ton of stories this week. I had to go through a lot of work to uh, get it down to just these five uh, stories this week. There was so much we could have talked yeah. about. But uh, and even even yeah, I took it. Lots of great stuff. Even there. I took editorial. I editorialized here and said, we've got to talk about this one company called Grokker that everybody's talking about in the States. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got news from Placecast and Social Vibe. We've also got, you know, obviously Facebook nearby and a huge talk about that that's coming up. We've also got, you know, our guest of the week is Patrick Reynolds from Triton Digital. And he's going to be talking about how important location is for this radio industry, the digital radio industry and the terrestrial radio industry. Very interesting. I love talking to, to Patrick simply because... You know, it's radio, and you, you never think twice about radio, but he thinks that it's the future. So it's a very interesting conversation. we got our funding acquisition news. Uh, really cool company in there that raised a little bit of money in stealth mode called Urban Compass we're going to be talking about. And, of course, our resource of the week, which is called I Saw Mommy Googling Santa Claus, which is a very cool, 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 cool resource. And we're, we're ready to go. All right, our first story. Uh, so uh, Placecast, you know, we talk about Placecast. I don't think uh, maybe there isn't a month that goes by that we don't talk about Place, Placecast. Not every episode, but at least once a month they, they come up. And they've, they've partnered with this company called Social Vibe. And I made a joke 
if you are Canadian and you are in Ottawa, or if you're in the porn, porn industry, maybe, I suppose, you know of a company called WeVibe, which is an Ottawa-based company that makes stellar vibrators. I don't know, but I just, I, you know, me, social vibe. I always think about we we vibe. Please, Asif, I haven't been in the eggnog, but save me. I don't know what you're thinking. Save about, me. I'm not there, but anyway. All right. So t talk about social vibe and this great relationship that they've just created with with PlaceCast. Yeah. So so this this is this for me is is a really really good partnership. I mean, PlaceCast just continues to roll out really great uh, partners. And so social vibe is a company that comes out of sort of the online gaming and publishing uh, space. And what they've done is, is they've come up with a relationship that um, rewards consumers that uh, go online, play games, uh, you know, visit websites uh, with virtual currency. And the idea is, is that um, you know, as you collect this virtual currency and you start to build up a uh, you know a certain uh, amount of credit in there, then you can connect that to physical bricks and mortar retailers, um, you know, that you get uh, notified, you know, based on PlaceCast's uh, SMS geofencing system as you walk nearby a particular uh, store. So, you know, let's say you're playing a game online, you're, you, you earn 10 bucks in virtual currency, you walk by a Best Buy, you get a push notification uh, because it's been geofenced using the PlaceCast system that then says, hey, come on in and, you know, use your, uh, use your money here kind of thing. So, uh, I like I really like this this relationship uh, because it, it, it's it's bringing those two worlds together the online e-commerce you know gaming world together with the physical bricks and mortar retail world and you know we don't we haven't seen a lot of those kinds of partnerships yet uh, but I think from a retailer perspective this is huge uh, has huge potential so I, I love it yeah I, mean, I can't add much more to that. Uh, other than the fact that this is, uh, I mean, I think this is one of those problems that will need to be solved in the coming year and, and shortly, which is that uh, transition from digital to bricks. You know, it's the it's the it's not from bricks to clicks anymore. It's clicks to bricks, and I think that these are the, uh, the, the this is probably yes. a good a good start into that. Uh, it, I think it's got to be that transition has got to be seamless. They've got to make sure it's so easy for one for them to for us to be able to make that transition that leap from uh, from digital to terrestrial. And uh, and I think that this is going to be the year of refining it. So I think this is this is a good start. Social Vibe working with PlaceCast. If you want any, in if you're interested in any of this, go to placecast.com or socialvibe.com. If you want to know about the WeVibe, go to wevibe.com. But I'm not going to throw that up, or else we will definitely get banned from from YouTube. So awkward first story done. Yikes. All right, uh, second story. This this is uh, I, I don't I, this is like an amorphous blob of a story because it started off. We were talking about it. It says Facebook um, nearby launches, and I have it somewhere on my iPhone. Um, I don't know if everybody out there has it yet. It, uh, the first time I checked, I didn't have it. It doesn't require you to download a new version of Facebook. It just appears inside of your screen. I'm just going to pull it up here, which is uh, um, you know when you when you pull up your uh, your stream and then there's the three little bars at the top and you click that and it gives you options. There's a nearby, nearby option, and it actually does come up for me. It does not come up for a Asif yet. No, I, I've been trying. Not it's working. not working. Poor Asif. But it actually uh, shows you, um, you know, it's 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 nearby. It shows you restaurants. It pulls in all the information from the your social graph from Facebook. This is a, you know, I, I don't know any other way to say this, but this is a a useful uh, piece of technology. I mean, I, I was pulling up museums, for example. Uh, nearby, there's a museum here, the Museum of War, Canadian War Museum, and uh, it just shows you the the capabilities. I'm in Ottawa, Canada. There have been uh, 3,214 likes, 9,650 visits, all through Facebook, all through Facebook. Um, gives you information, calls, you can like it, you can check in, you can see it on the map, you get driving directions, you get feedback and, and uh, you know from people that have left comments about the place. Uh, like, if, if Facebook can turn that on like that, what does that mean for, for everybody else, Asif? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it creates huge challenges for uh, the obvious uh, player here, which is is Foursquare. Um, you know, and, and what I like about it is, is you know, the simplicity. I, again, I haven't been able to get it to work on my device yet, uh, but I've seen the screenshots. I've seen you know yours there, uh, and so on. And uh, you know, it, it's that it's that simplicity of just clicking a button. Uh, you know, seeing things around me, seeing recommendations based on my friends. You know, through Facebook. Uh, where they've checked in, what they've liked, uh, you know, ratings, all that stuff, you know, all coming together in one place. Um, 
you know, effectively, you know, emulating the Foursquare Explorer function, um, you know, in, in all the same categories and everything else, from what I can tell. So, for me, it, it, it is a bit of a Foursquare killer, and, and, and in some respects, it's, it's I, I simply look at it, you know, from the point of view of, you know, 26 or 27, I guess now, million users on Foursquare, you know, and how long it's taking to get to that level versus, you know, you know, half a billion uh, mobile users on, on Facebook. Um, you know, and if you can simply turn on a feature like that, it, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's pretty cool. And, and, and obviously, you know, th this whole nearby thing that they put out there has been built by Josh Williams and the whole Gowalla team Huge that story. came over. Uh, you know, so it's not like they don't understand this. It's not like... You know the you know the you know there, there's some pedigree and experience there that they acquired. I mean, it was a talent acquisition at the time. We looked at it that way, and now they're starting to reap some benefits from it. Yeah, and I think this is just the beginning because that team is a talented team. And I mean, we all loved Goala when it came out. Man, we loved that app. And uh, and so you're starting to see these things. And, and you know, he, here's where it gets very interesting: is that you know, in order to be in, uh, if you're a merchant or a location, so you're a shop, a place of business, in order to be in uh, Facebook nearby, you need to have a Facebook page for your shop or your business, place of business. So, you know, I, I, when you're trying to decide between setting up a Facebook uh, shop or a Facebook page for your shop or a Foursquare page for your shop, what do you do? You know, when you think about the local, the density of people who are using Facebook every day, this app is a sticky app. People are using this every day on their phones. You think about the density. I mean, how many people in a given neighborhood are using it every single day? Uh, it's hard to compete with that. You can't compete with that. Like, you yeah. can't. I, I think the only, the, I, I guess the only sort of trepidation I have or, or you know, Area where I could see, um, you know, slower adoption than you might think is is really around, you know, just the, you know, how people use for, you know, the the user base of Foursquare and and, and the makeup of, of people who share location on yeah. that versus, you know, the makeup of people who are, who are going to do it in in Facebook. Um, you know, I like for me personally as an example, you know, I use Foursquare. I check in all over the place. You see my check ins. They're connected to what I'm doing on Twitter. They're connected to LinkedIn. But Facebook is 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 not connected to any of that stream for me, right? Facebook for me is is personal. It's families, photos, and you know high school friends, and it's got nothing to do with the business world. Now that isn't to say you know the LBMA and and other groups have you know we have Facebook pages in there, but I'm not taking my personal like you know stuff I'm doing. Uh, from a location point of view and posting that to Facebook today. No, but, but you know what, for discovery? For discovery, yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? So as long as you can maintain those privacy walls or, or, or you know, how you know, have control over what you want to share. So the question I would have to Facebook would be, okay, if I decide I'm going to check in at a location on, on Facebook and, you know, is is there going to be? Are you going to allow me to say I don't want to post that to Facebook, but I want to post it to Twitter? Yeah, never. Right, that's not going to no. happen, right? And, and so for you know, and, and so so I think that's where there's some challenge. Well, you know the. Um it, it's when you think about the scale of what Facebook has brought and and, uh, and the fact that Foursquare has struggled it recently, 26 million, 27 million users is not a small number of users. It's just no, 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 no. It, not at all. it's just not big compared to what, what we're talking about with the behemoth in, in Facebook. So there's a, there's so much more data in, in Facebook. And once you start to crunch this and I think that, you know, the Goala team are going to do this. They're, you're going to they're going to start get into getting into. Uh, curated uh, tours like they were trying to do back with Goala. And now they have an audience to be able to do that. And and this is just step one, I believe. But it, it's funny. It absolutely is. There's, there's a great interview with Josh Williams uh, after this thing got uh, announced uh, earlier in the week um, that you should take a look at. I think TechCrunch did it. Um, yes. Uh, for, for those uh, who are listening or watching out there. But, um, the uh, you know... You know, and there was there was a sort of sort of response from from Foursquare, uh, you know, immediately following this announcement as well. So they came out with a, you know, with this thing where they basically said, well, hey, you know, so now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna suck some Facebook data into, uh, you know, into the uh, Explore function as well. So basically, what Foursquare said was, um, 
you know, the data about your friends uh, um, and what your friends are doing on, from a Facebook perspective will surface that information, you know, when you go and hit Explore and Foursquare yeah. as well. Maintaining the privacy wall, however. So even if you're not friends with somebody on Foursquare, but you are friends with them on Facebook, um, you know, that the information about what they're doing will be surfaced into Foursquare, but not necessarily shared. Uh, because you're not you're not Foursquare connected, yeah. so th th that's an interesting thing. I don't think that's you know going to be enough uh, to save them, um, you know, from that perspective. Which kind of leads into the next uh, piece that we wanted to talk about, which is uh, there was also uh, an announcement about a relationship between uh, Apple and Foursquare. So it's like it's like kind of like like Foursquare is a little uh, promiscuous here, right? It's uh, you know. Um, it's this circle that that happens around these these leaders, but yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, the big thing here is that uh, you know, as everybody knows, we talked about it last week. Google uh, Google Maps came out on the iOS, and everybody, you know, uh, they they said that th that had you read this story, right? That they they thought that the yep. impact of Google Maps on iOS, um, you know, increased uh, I iOS um, six I installs. Uh, you know the operating system it increased by forty percent as a result of that. But then they realized that they also launched in China at that same time. So, but but the big thing is that uh, Apple is now working with. In the I guess they I don't know if they've announced this formally, but there's rumors that Apple and Foursquare are going to work together on bringing Foursquare location data into Apple Maps for iOS. Yeah, and and for me, I mean, you, you use the word promiscuous uh, to describe Foursquare. I, 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 you know, for me, it's not about uh, about that. For me, it's about survival. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, and, and personally, I think that this relationship with Apple is, uh, you know, a premonition to uh, a full out acquisition by Apple uh, sometime in the in, in the next year. Uh, I, I don't personally, I don't think Foursquare is going to survive on its own. Uh, I don't think it can. No. Um, you know, I was reading this 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 story about the you know what, so so the sim the simple relationship that they're talking about between Apple and Foursquare, just for people listening, is Foursquare's got a bunch of data about places, you know, and inf you know rich information about you know what people are doing at those places, uh, and Apple has you know a mapping product that is is still evolving, and so if we can layer that data that Foursquare has on top of those locations that are being displayed in the Apple Maps environment that you know make, makes the Apple Maps uh, a, a richer uh, piece for me you know I don't I don't think Foursquare is going to survive so in the same story what we heard was while there's 27 million users there's only actually 8 million active users on the platform today they're only doing 2 million in revenue as a company um, you know like that that is just not given all the money that they've raised and, and you know how long they've been at it now that is just you know just not good enough quite frankly. And and so, you know, I think for a company like Apple, this is a test to see, you know, what this can do and, and a chance to work with the data. Uh, but ultimately, I, I, you know, whether it's Apple or somebody else, right, Foursquare will not be around as a standalone company by the end of next year. Not going to happen. So there's there's my first prediction of the year <laughs> already coming before the prediction. Well, yeah, I, I'm with you on this. I mean, yeah, Foursquare has raised seventy million dollars. Two million dollars in revenue is the valuation that they're getting, and that you know we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago about their, their inability to go out and find some funding at the at this ridiculous uh, uh, price that they're asking. But they really don't because they missed the boat on Google. Uh, Facebook isn't going to buy them um, at this point. So the only one that's limping right now in the map mapping space is is obviously Apple, and uh, Apple could use this, and then it brings you know that that battle between the hardware-based guys like Apple um, and yeah. Nokia, right? And uh, where they have these mapping solutions where they're a little bit richer data and the software-based guys like like uh, Facebook and even Google. Google is dominating in iOS uh, applications. They're, they're, they're beautiful apps that they're putting out, especially Google Maps and, and, and Gmail. So you're going to have this, that's going to be the battle going forward is the hardware-based guys, which is pre-installed on board on hardware versus the add-on software like Facebook and uh, and Google. It's going to be an interesting battle going forward. But this is, that's what we were saying. This is kind of like a, a blurry story, which starts off with Facebook nearby. And you look at the, the ripple effect the ramifications of doing something like that. Who knows if this is a Foursquare killer? I, we just don't believe that Foursquare is a standalone business at this point, And they haven't proved it. And, um, you know, patience is wearing thin. I just don't know what they're going to get for, you know, their $70 million invested, you know. And we'll see what happens with Apple. But that's a good prediction. I, I, don't, I don't see them surviving either. So, 
All right. Yeah, there, there's the amorphous blob. We promised the rest of the stories will not be that long. We knew that one was going to be tight yeah. because it was just, there's so much going on in that space. And it's so, it's like, it's circuitous is the word that I'm looking for. So if you have any comments about that, we'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Please reach out. You know our addresses, Rob, at untether.tv if you want to reach me there or uh, cf at the lbma.com. All right, so let's move on to the third story. And this, you know, it might play right into this whole thing. A company called Grokker, or an app, yeah, a company called Grokker released their app. Uh, it's only available in the States right now, as far as I can tell. Uh, it is, a go, I think it's a grokkerapp.com. And this is an app that I think is in direct response to Google Now, or it's the equivalent to a Google Now. It's supposed to be on iOS. What have you heard about this thing, Asif? Well, I mean, cer certainly uh, it's getting lots of PR and press attention. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's exactly as you describe. It's the iOS version of Google Now. Um, you know, so for those who aren't familiar with Google Now yet, personalized search discovery platform, uh, kind of predictive, uh, you know, modeling, predictive uh, search uh, results being surfaced based on, you know, a whole bunch of things, location and, and everything else. Um, the only difference that I can tell from what I've read about Grokker versus Google Now is, is there's no voice uh, component uh, to it, right? So, so, so they haven't uh, you know, they have they haven't incorporated that like there is in the Google piece. Uh, but um, you know, uh, remains to be seen. I haven't had a chance to play with this one um, yet. Uh, but you know, Google Now itself as, as a service, uh, you know. You and I have talked about before. We love it. We think it's it's absolutely where you know where the market's going and, and where search is going and kind of that you sort of you know just um, you know unhampered predictive you know stuff being pushed to me based on you know context and location and everything else. And so you know to have that on an iOS uh, environment, uh, I'm surprised. You know this isn't something Apple did on their own. To be fair, uh, but you know hey. Glad somebody somebody else came up with it, and probably yet another thing that Apple will look at, uh, you know, taking out at some point in, in the not too distant future, or or just copying and building their own. Yeah, I, I think that these guys are at a disadvantage. I mean, I have a U.S. account as well, so I, I got a chance to download this and play around with it. And now I'm not sure that this is like Google Now. Uh, I think it tries to be. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it's because I'm up in Canada and the accuracy isn't great or the data isn't great or the connectivity isn't great. But it, it, it's showing me days old news items. It shows me the weather very effectively. And it is 33 degrees and snowing here. Um, but it also, uh, you know, the news, I, I don't get it yet. And, and, you know, I think it's it's too early to judge at this point. Um but, uh, you know, it, it tries to do a little bit too much at this point, And maybe it's just not ready for Canada. Maybe it's only working in the U.S. So I'd love to hear from you guys. I don't get any notifications about delays in traffic. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it brings in trending stories from, the, uh, from Twitter. And it just lists the, the trending stories. You really can't see it very well. But it just lists the trending stories. It, and it, uh, it goes through my social graph. So I signed in with Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And it did all of those kind of things. But again, man, like... Um, I, you know, this is something that, you know, here's a, yeah, here, here's something that I don't I, get. I think functionally the, the premise of the, of, of the solution is, is solid. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of these things. It's like Google now in some respects, you know, we, we have to wait to see what kind of content is going to be delivered. Yeah. But, but the mechanism for pushing content is solid. Yeah. I mean, I, right. I love the idea. I, and and the, the feedback that I've heard from Google now users is, is, is love, right? Is love. Yeah. I heard this great story uh, on uh, This Week in Tech, Twit, and Leo Laporte, and it was uh, Robert Scoble that uses this kind of technology that he tied it into his TripIt account. And uh, he was on a plane, and this is, and he, he's one of those guys that never turns his phones off on a plane, but he was on a plane and they were taxiing out, and, and uh, he, he got a TripIt notification through uh, Google Now that said that the plane that he was on was canceled before they even announced that it was canceled. So he was able to then go back, you know, using his phone, get back online, book another seat, one of only three available uh, on another plane to get out of, uh, out of out of town on time. And uh, he classifies that as winning. 
<laughs> right? He wins in life yeah. because of something like that. And, and my limited exposure to Grokker, I'm not, I, I don't use it. I, I tried, I tried, I tried, but I don't. But my limited exposure to Grokker is that it's not that, not like Google Now is. So I think Apple has a good chance of getting in there. But uh, if you're interested in go to Grokker Labs, G-O-K-R Labs.com, G-O-K-R Labs.com. And if you're using this and it's in the States and you're getting good results from this we'd love to hear please let us know just send us an email or send us a tweet or something like that and let us know that you love it uh, we want to love it our fourth story this again like these these they're provocative names senseware senseware launches this this service called adware which is an indoor ad location-based ad distribution network am i close yeah yeah so <laughs> i love it so Senseware is a company who's been around for yeah. a while. I mean, these guys are one of the big players in indoor positioning. Um, and, and this adware platform is, uh, is interesting. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about indoor, indoor positioning on this show. Um, you know, we've talked about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth-based systems. We've talked about pushing, you know, offers to consumers based on where they are in the store. We've talked about the analytics opportunities, around understanding traffic patterns as people move around stores. This is on the you know consumer engagement uh, you know conversion side of things. What's a little bit different about it, what I like about it is is that the, the platform that they put together here is about delivering a, a an ad or a coupon or an offer of some kind, but based on on indoor position or the exact position of a consumer, but it, but it's not limited to a single mechanism. So it's not only you know a uh, you know a, a Wi-Fi based push message, or you know it's not only a uh, you know uh, an in-app thing. It, it, it's it's whatever you want. So you can you can deliver the offer over you know SMS. You can deliver it over you know an in-app notification. You can deliver it by email even. Um, you know so so they've combined all of that and, and then built that around an indoor positioning uh, uh, piece. So I, I mean, does this? It, Who's, I don't even know how to ask this question because we do talk about indoor mapping quite a bit. Is is there? There's obviously enough room for all these companies that are doing these things because they all sound the same when we describe them and we're in this business and we describe it's like it's a blended blah of names of companies doing the same thing. Is there anything that distinguishes these guys like Senseware from and, and this platform Adware from anything else? Well, I think I mean the platform, the advertising platform itself is 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 the distinguishing piece. The, yeah. the, the complicated where it all sort of you know is the same is, you know, what's the platform for figuring out location? Yeah. You know, half of the ones out there are using Wi-Fi, or more than half are using Wi-Fi. Some are using you know low frequency Bluetooth. You know, and a few are using strange things like LEDs that we talked about or ultrasound or whatever. Dolphin, dolphin sonar. The bulk, the bulk of them are Wi-Fi or or, or Bluetooth based. Um, and, and so, you know, the you know the challenge with some of these is is even when you take in just the Wi-Fi guys, and and I believe Senseware is, is in that camp, um, you know, is from a retailer that's thinking about using any of these platforms, the question becomes, okay, you know, do I have to go and, and install new Wi-Fi gear to make this happen? So is there you know is there capital cost that comes with that, or is the is the system piggybacking on existing you know? Private Wi-Fi just has to just has to you know ping the ping the device to know where it is. So there's a lot of you know different ways to do that, um, and, and so I think that's where you start to see you know differences in business models and and whatnot. Even though they're all kind of effectively delivering the same service. Yeah. Right. So anyhow, it's it's tough as an ad platform. This this adware piece. I like the ability to deliver the the, uh, the the offer or whatever it is over multiple different frameworks, whether it's SMS or in-app or email or what have you. So. And, and I think that that's one of the, uh, you know, and uh, as these companies come along, I mean, that kind of differentiation disappears as well, right? And then it becomes how many customers you have, and, and then it's a land right. grab. So really, you know, we shouldn't get caught up in the technology and the implementation as much as we should be right now is that they should be just running out and getting as many customers to lock them in. But yeah. So if you're interested in Senseware, just go to Senseware, S E N S E Ware. That's W H E R E dot com. If you wanted some more information. All right, our our fifth and last story of this week: uh, the launch of what is it? Uh, Shoptastic? No, uh, Craptastic? No, Shop Craptacular? Shop Shop Shopular? Right? Is that about right? Shop. 
Yes. Well, okay. Now, um, you'll notice here uh, that uh, we're being a little sarcastic, but uh, I can only put a kind of a WTF around this company, Asif. Uh, I know you feel the same way as I do. What is Shopular and and why is Shopular, I think, is the better question, isn't it? Yeah, I, I have to say I'm not I'm not overly enthused with this one. Um, so this is a Palo Alto uh, new startup out of Palo Alto. Uh, raise raise a bunch of money from uh, Y Combinator. Um, you know, delivering coupons. Uh, you know, in store. You know, based on, uh, on geolocation. You know, geofencing. Um, nothing new or unique about that. Um, we're working with a bunch of mall owners, Simon Westfield, others, to, to kind of test this out. Um, the two guys that are running it have a bit of uh, experience in the, in the field. Uh, so one guy is a former uh, uh, Google uh, engineer. Um, the other guy uh, spent some time with Looped, which was uh, one of the early Foursquare competitors. Apparently they both spent some time at Shopkick and uh, left Shopkick to do this. Um, I don't get it. I, I, I really don't get it. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's just too many of these platforms out there in the space already. We don't need another one. Uh, I don't see anything unique uh, about this whatsoever. Um, you know, they're talking about you know just making it you know easier for the for the shopper, you know, to find the stuff when they're in store and you know, kind of like a search uh, capability built into this. And, you know, who cares, right? I mean, when you have a Google now and you have a passbook and you have, you know, Facebook, you know, surfacing nearby, like. Who needs this? Well, you know what? It's funny because, you know, 250,000 people downloaded this. 80% of them were women. and um, But uh, but I don't know if that's a good number or not when you compare to the, you know, as we said, the, the Facebooks or, or the fact that the, you know, iOS with their their pass uh, their passbook is, is installed on 160 million devices. But this is just basically a glorified location-based coupon announcer. Right. That's that's what it is. So, so that's what it is. And then you redeem the coupons, you know, uh, by scanning a, a barcode or a QR code. You know, have they heard of Level yeah. Up or like? I mean, like or one of the other nine hundred others. others. You know, like come on, guys. Yeah. Like, right. let's do something different. Like, why why do we have to just take the same thing, reskin it, call it, you know, Shopular or whatever else? And and, and it, like it's just. And especially with all the advances we're seeing, you know, at the, at the OS level with things like Google Now and, and things like Passbook and, you know, like it just, you know, we need we need more innovation than this. I'm sorry. But. I'm with you. This this uh, it was a head scratcher. Uh, you, you know, it, it shows you maybe maybe this is an investment in the team and they're going to shape the business model. Lord, I hope not, because people have invested in this and uh, people you know, like uh, consumers have invested their time in this and their effort in this. But this is basically a, a, a it is it's it's a coupon book. And uh, but it's a digital version. And I, I, I'm with you. It's time to innovate. Like if, if there's one thing that we can say goodbye to in 2012 is are, are, are the people who just think that they can emulate or copy other companies. Um, and we're seeing yeah. we're seeing this everywhere. And and Shopular, whatever you are, um, you know, you're the same as Shoptastic and, and everybody else who's doing this kind of stuff. And it, it's time to put an end to it. So, you know, I wish I had like a sound effect in here to kind of flush it down the toilet. But... Maybe this is an investment in the team, and they're gonna they're gonna manipulate. As I said, they're gonna change the idea as you go here. Maybe this is part of a master plan that we don't see. Well, and these aren't silly guys. No. I mean, these guys have been around. They they know the industry. Um, you know, so I mean, like the, these are credible people that are running this thing. I just you know I just expect more. So do I. I think we all do at this point. Um, so if you're interested in it, go to uh, Shopular app. Um, I mean, if you want to see something different, and you want to talk about coupon, yeah. And here's a story that you know, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a chance to bring up a few weeks ago. But really quickly, you want to go see something? Go look at Valpac. You know, the, the, <laughs> the blue, the, the blue. You know, the coupon company of coupon companies, the blue envelope. Go look at Valpac Digital. They did a deal with Roximity. You know, remember, yep. remember Daniel that yep. we had on the yep. show uh, as a guest a while ago. The guys who are pushing, um, you know, stuff in into your in-car navigation system. There, you know, there's something different. So now you got Valpac partnering, delivering their coupons inside of the proximity system. Yeah. And and that that's that is innovative. That is actually of creating value for for us as consumers. And uh, so I I don't know what to make of this other than uh, you know if you're interested in check it out shopularapp.com if you're using it you know we'd love the feedback if you want to defend it hey if you're one if you actually work at the company or if you funded the company we'd love to have you on. give us a ring let us yeah, know please
Shopular. Shopularapp.com. Goodness gracious. It is not the future. It is but the past. That is so 2010, what I, we, just, we just covered there. So those are the five stories. Uh, you know, the way that uh, we see it, and I actually contributed to this one, bringing the Grokker story back in. So I, I feel pretty good about this. Um, well, you always contribute, Rob. That's Come right. On. Well, it, these, are, these are great stories. You can see how this is, there's, uh, you know, we're getting a little bit uh, chippy here around stories that are retreads and, and, uh, and uh, like a company like Shopular. And we're still trying to figure out what's going on with the Foursquare stuff and the Facebook stuff. And I mean, this is this, this, these are the things we were talking about at the beginning of the year. So you can see that this is obviously a big battlefield and these stories demonstrate that. Um, this, is, this is not going to end anytime soon. Contrary, uh, you know, contrary mm -hmm. uh, to what the Mayan or not the Mayan, but the, you know, today's December 21st. We're supposed to be dead by now anyways. Exactly. All right. So those are the five stories. Uh, if you have any feedback about those, if you should have been in one of those stories, please reach out on tether at gmail.com or rob at untether.tv or seif at the lbma.com. I think I'll just go with my rob at untether.tv. I think it's just easier. Um, promotes the pr promotes the right brand, not Gmail. So please let us know. Let us know if you should have been there. Okay, so uh, as I said at the very beginning, I had a great opportunity to sit down with Patrick Reynolds, who's the Chief Strategic Officer for a company called Triton Digital. I've interviewed him. This is the second time I've sat down with him. Uh, a year ago, I sat with him, and, and again this year, and it, fascinating. If you're interested in, in media and the way that media is changing, uh, you know, he said at one point in this interview, or this episode, that it's... I said, you know, how do you how do you overcome the challenges that newspapers are having if you're in the radio business? You don't want to go down the same path, which is basically a cliff, um, and they're falling over that cliff. He said, you know, Rob, media is media. There isn't, you know, we're, we're on a convergence path where there is no newspaper, there is no radio, there is no television, there's no magazines. Magazines are doing video and audio. Television are doing audio. Radio is doing video and print, and print is doing audio and video. It's just it's just coming all together in the center, and it's a battlefield, man. And it is bloody. But we stayed away from that in this clip. What we talked about really was about the impact of location and terrestrial and digital radio and what it's going to take uh, to, you know, is that the holy grail for radio's future success? And uh, yeah, and you know, this is like right at the heart of what I love. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, the LBMA, we, we, we love looking at, you know, any media and, and the impact of location on that media. And you, you know, we did some work last year with the National Radio Systems Committee uh, in the U.S. around this. They put out a big RFP around this last year. Um, so, yeah, I think radio is poised to be reinvented, uh, you know, from a location perspective. Okay, here's Patrick. I'm going to come back with uh, my thoughts on the, the flip side. Here is Patrick Reynolds, the Chief Strategic Officer for uh, Triton Digital. Location. I, I just want to talk for a moment about location and the importance of location, location-based marketing on, um, you know, the impact that it has on what we're talking about here, digital radio, because th that really is where I think that the these the, the digital radio can have the biggest impact on solo mo. Give you an example. Songza, right, is a great uh, service, uh, you know, digital radio playlists. I love the way that they've done all of the timing. You know, you wake up in the morning, it's like, hey, click on the wake up channel. Right. Um, but they do, which always blows my mind, they do banner ads, right? Like, what do you do with a radio app is that you hit go and I put it in my pocket and I leave, right? But they pay banner ads, no audio cues at all. I, I would think that uh, location-based audio cues in digital radio is a no-brainer. What, I mean, is this the future of, is location-based marketing the future of radio? I think it's a huge part of the equation. Uh, I think for the reason you mentioned, uh, display and even video is, is certainly display. It's very inefficient in a mobile context, whether you're plugging that phone into your dash and driving, or you're driving and can't look at stuff, but you can listen, or you put on your headphones, put that in your pocket, and are on your way. Audio, again, is really the thing that resonates the most. And by the way, it has maximum attentiveness because it's not competing with, you don't have simultaneous audio ads, you have one ad at a time. And if it's 10 or 15 seconds, I think it's quite effective. And it's further accentuated in the effectiveness department if it's, hey, you're about to walk by uh, you know, not your average Joe's restaurant. The happy hour if it's from four to six and there's $5 apps. Yeah. Okay, so again, that's the context that mobile and digital provides to traditional media that can really make it special and make it pop if it's properly leveraged and in defense of everybody not doing it, without scale, it's just added expense without offset revenue. So it's it's just a matter of maturity of the space. Yeah, 
that, that's a perfect example of that. <laughs> Certainly, when you, you when you start to think about the potential around location based marketing, you, you're right. You are that it, it's that one to one marketing, but if there it's literally only one to one. Uh, the expense outweighs it, but somebody's got to start to invest in this kind of technology to be able to build these out sooner rather than later, I would think. Yeah, uh, I think the technology is very much not the issue relative to just pure scale. If, you know, I think uh, in the U.S. we say that uh, 92% of households, I want to say, have access to traditional radio, you know, over-the-air radio. Um, and I think that the number is probably a little bit less than that. Uh, in terms of digital, whether it's mobile or desktop, but the penetration, the actual usage would be considerably less than that, probably in the 30, 35% range at last, if I were to conjure up the last e-marketer data I saw. So once that 35 comes closer to the 92 and you have scale, the technology is ready to roll. It's just spreading out a uh, fixed cost over a, a larger audience and making it more palatable. So for you guys who are squarely sitting in the middle of the future, of radio, right? You guys are right there. You 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 balance traditional, and you're working with the the pure play digital. Does it ever get frustrating for you guys to say like like you just want this to move a little bit faster? You've been doing it for six years. It's like, come on, let's just get this thing moving faster, faster, faster. Does it ever get frustrating for you guys? I wake up and kick the dog every day. <laughs> That's I just can't believe. Yeah, you know, it's not here yet. But you know, honestly, I, I'm kind of the eternal optimist. I think every day is going to be the day. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, every day has been the day. It's just not been, you know, all caps and exclamation points. Every day, audience builds more than the day prior. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. We see the numbers. And, you know, it's just, it might not be um, one giant seismic thing that happens. It could be just a series of little things that one day you kind of pull back and say, wow, uh, it was two million people that were listening concurrently last month. And six months on it's 10 million people and that's enough to get really any advertiser's perspective yeah. especially since we know a lot about each and every one of those 10 million in a way that broadcasters have no idea yeah, yeah. and that we can serve 10 million ads to 10 million people if we want to or we can serve one ad to 10 million people in a way that you just can't do otherwise so it, it may be just a slow climb uh, or, you know, there could be this sort of event that happens, you know, if Apple were to do something very significant, that could be one of the things they tend to have an immediate impact on a marketplace. That could be the thing. But, you know, we just keep developing the technology uh, to keep in step with the times. And, and when it happens, uh, our clients will be ready because we've we've been working hard on the R&D to keep them abreast of trends and ready to capitalize when the worm turns. Well, and that was Patrick Reynolds, uh, as you can see. Um, he's uh, the uh, Chief Strategic Officer for uh, Triton uh, Digital. I really like having uh, Patrick on simply because he brings such a, a complete awareness about this industry. It's pretty incredible what's going on. And uh, we spent a lot of time, Asif, talking about this thing um, around the Internet Royalty Fairness Act which is what he thinks is the biggest impediment in order to be able to get this out, which is that, you know, people like Pandora, digital plays, digital radio stations like Pandora play an insane, pay an insane amount of money for uh, digital rights to be able to play music, right? And this is this is the biggest challenge is that it's, it could bankrupt these guys if, if, they, if they actually became radio stations. Um, this is where most of their money goes into the licensing. And... Uh, Terrestrial radio stations don't pay those rights uh, on the internet, so it's an unfair advantage. Said so something's got to give. They're fighting this in Congress right now. Very interesting, uh, full episode found up on Untether.tv if you're interested in that thing. It's a long one, but it is good. It is great. It is really relevant to what's going on right now in this media space. So that was Patrick Reynolds. We really appreciate him letting us use that clip for this week in location-based marketing. God. Yes. All right, we've got a few more items of business, starting with our funding and acquisition piece. Chase Bank buys a company, what is it like? I, it's not a competitor to Groupon, but it's like a like a local competitor, a small competitor called uh, Bloomspot? Yeah, it's a smaller competitor. I mean, they got about 2 million members. Um, they, they got about a half million uh, merchants, apparently, that were on the system. Uh, so the company's called Bloomspot. They're also... Both Chase and, and Bloomspot are San Francisco-based uh, companies. 
Um, and, uh, you know, Bloomspot, there was no, I didn't see a number on the actual acquisition uh, in terms of how much they paid, but, uh, you know, Bloomspot had raised about 46 million bucks previously. I saw, I saw a number, from, Asif. I saw that? a number. It was $35 million, the speculation. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, anyways, you know, I like this deal from a Chase perspective. I think this makes a lot of sense. And Bloomspot you know, had already started to differentiate in a very nice way in partnering with these guys already. So, you know, the difference between a Bloomspot and a, and a Groupon is that, you know, instead of just pushing out, you know, daily deals all over the place, um, you know, sort of randomly, what they were doing is, is, is working with the merchants and letting the merchants push out offers to their customers, to their loyal customers. Uh, through the platform and then tracking uh, redemption uh, via via you know connections to the credit card um, you know and, and the payments vehicles which obviously Chase was powering so you know there, there's some nice synergies here between the platform and, and the bank um, and, and how those things fit together so so I like this deal yeah so do I I mean I, I, we're going to start seeing more of this who do you think buys Groupon. Visa, MasterCard, American <laughs> Express? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's not worth much anymore. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot more people that can come into the uh, into the mix now um, that can afford it um, than, you know, a, a year ago. So, um, Wait for our prediction show. I, don't know. I mean, I mean I, I, for, for me, I think it's a carrier. Yeah. Oh, don't don't say anymore. Let's. This is part of the prediction show, right? Uh, you know. You asked the question. I know. So, I, it was just know, a tease. I'm going to say it's a carrier. Right. I'll leave it at that. It's going to cost some money, though. Like, there's a. I think this is still going to. If if Groupon goes anywhere, we'll talk about this next week. It um, it's going to be in the billions of dollars. I, I, maybe not six billion, uh, but it'll be it'll be up there. Uh, yeah, not thirty five million dollars. So forty six million dollars in, thirty five million dollars out. Wow, this coupon business is really good. It's discounted. There's another discount joke, right? So that's a good way to lose money. Invest in a coupon company. Oh. Should I continue, or should we go into the next story? <laughs> All right, let's let's keep. Going. All right, you love this story. See if you love this. The next company. story we yeah. love. So there you urban, go. Urban Urban Compass. Talk about this company. Big data, no termination points. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with a company called uh, what was that company called? Clear Story. Yeah, Clear Story. Um, we talked about that. They said we love the the big data crunch for effectiveness. And here is Urban Compass. Talk about this great company. We don't even know because it's in stealth. But what's the what's what's the story behind um, Urban Compass? Well, I mean, this is a company that understands that they, the, you know the data. You know, and this is what I talk about all the time. Data is wherever people are, and and you know it's it's about you know just you know making it accessible um you know whenever it's needed wherever it's needed you know and it, it's completely location you know based um uh, again we don't know how it's all going to play out from an urban compass perspective it's it's still in stealth what we do know is you know the two guys who put this thing together this deal together are you know superstars that get it right so you got the, the guy who one of the founders is a guy named uh Ori Allon. Uh, he's the, you know the key engineer behind this thing. The guy has already built companies that he sold to Google and Twitter uh, in the past, so he gets data. And then you got the the Goldman Sachs guys who funded this. So, by the way, so they raised eight million bucks. Uh, when, when yeah, that's the, that's so the story. Eight million yeah. bucks um, going into this company uh, coming from Goldman Sachs, um, and a guy named uh, Robert Rifkin uh, did this deal. Uh, he's he's the Goldman Sachs guy that put this thing together. So. Uh, this thing has huge potential, uh, fantastic pedigree, and guys who understand, you know, where data is going and and and, and how location uh, fits into that. Well, here's what they say: is that we understand people, we understand technology. We're building a platform of hyperlocal knowledge and information to help people make their most important personal decisions. So this is a predictive. This is supposed to be predictive. You, you, a whole bunch of inputs will tell you what the output will be before you know it. I suppose. Yeah, and there was a quote from a guy named Ken Howery uh, at Founders Fund that just sort of described the opportunity this way. He, and I'll just read the quote. It says, the mobile hyperlocal guys out there, and then in brackets, you know, example, Google and Foursquare, they know where you've been, but they don't really know who you are as a person, and they don't do a great job of making quality recommendations to you for important complex decisions. Because they don't, they haven't combined the great data sets together, right? And that's you know, they ha and they haven't made it accessible and easy. And that's what I think a company like Urban Compass is trying to do. You know, I, this this plays well into you know some some people's predictions about um, uh, wearable computing. 
that this is going to be a, a massive trend going forward is wearable computing. And I think that once you get like, a, you know, a Google Glasses or um, something like, a, you know, a, an Apple Watch or something to that extent where like they have the phones right now. Um, but I think that when you start interacting with it in, in a very active way, like like Google Glasses, you're, you're going to be able to start to, to pattern uh, people's, uh, people's lives and you're going to be able to get that data that is so missing right now, that personality that he just described there. Yeah. Um, instead of just straight up data, but you know what? I, I um, you can you can infer quite a bit through straight up data and through. I'm still waiting for this. How many times have we mentioned this? Well, but, I mean, they're going to go. I mean, they, again, like it's in yeah. stealth. They haven't said a lot about the actual platform yet. What they did say was there was another thing here where uh, in one of the uh, articles I read it said that they describe it as Urban Compass will have a human network of people employed by the company that will go into urban areas and collect data. It's kind of like, think of, think of you know, you know how they, Google collects all the street, the street View stuff, right? So think about a bunch of people out there, though, like just regular people out there collecting data on behalf of this company. Then then data gets fed into a platform, and, and, and then those, you know, that, that data and the collectors are, are followed by machines, he describes it, um, that are powered by their software. So you, you, you have, you know, real real-time, you know, purpose-built collectors of data out there, you know, in neighborhoods, you know, gathering stuff that, you know, is, is then being, you know, sort of amassed and, and tracked by machines. Oh, my God. You know, and managed by software. Sound, so it sounds, I love it. It sounds, it sounds like it sounds super cool but super complicated. And and mm. I think that, uh, you know, uh, what I would say is that, uh, you know, the debit system and the credit card system know quite about, about my personality already, right? Uh, they know my patterns. They know a lot about that stuff. That data exists. You don't have to send, score, like, robot armies down nope. into neighborhoods. It's, it's just yeah. there. Well, I think that this is cool. And and uh, we'll talk about more. I'm sure we will be talking about uh, big data, small screens, termination points in our in our, um, our year-end wrap-up and prediction show. We will. So that's uh, Urban Compass. If you're interested, just go to urbancompass.com. You can sign up to get more information about what they are. There's a great article in TechCrunch. Uh, so just search for Urban Compass and TechCrunch, and you'll be able to find a little bit more information. It's pretty vague because it is in stealth. We'll be looking forward to hearing some more about these guys in 2013. We'll be sure to bring that to you. Uh, they're, they're a company on our radar now. All right, our uh, last funding story, a company called Tappet, uh, raising $2.5, $2.3 million uh, for, this is an Australian company doing NFC, what, NFC posters, right? Yeah, so I mean, basically, yeah, they, they built an NFC uh, platform, um, you know, that, uh, like, like they're, they're creating NFC chips, basically, that you can embed into, into in any physical object, a poster. Um, so they're at the sort of manufacturing layer around NFC and kind of building building the platform around it. So um, you know, and then sort of making that available to to anybody at, at an enterprise level. So uh, two point three million bucks. It's led by a group called MPC Ventures, uh, which is uh, also uh, in Australia, um, and a, another group called uh, Monash Private Capital. For anyone that's tracking this stuff. So yeah. not much to say there. Uh, you know, we all know that NFC is. You know, I've read some stories that frame this as, uh, you know, most people know NFC from, uh, you know, commerce and transactions and payments. And, and I don't know anybody, really, even in my circle of friends, that there are very few of them that know uh, NFC at any stage, simply because it's not, you know, it's not in a majority of phones. So I, it's, it's good to see that we're, we're branching off NFC. Remember, we talked, we started the year saying that NFC, we didn't pundits other than ourselves started talking about the year this is the year of nfc it's going to be everywhere it's going to be the, the way that the wallet is going to change everything payment is going to come blah 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 blah, blah. we all know that it didn't happen yeah. it's good to see that they're starting to use productive use like we're starting to look at alternative uses for nfc i i would say that this is not a productive use of nfc because there are other technologies that exist today that can emulate these kind of things that they're trying to do here even from just yeah but so you know, Tap is a company that's been around for a yeah. while. I mean, this, these aren't—they're not new to NFC. No. They didn't just go out and raise some money to go and build, you know, something new. I mean, they've been at this for a while. They have huge, huge customers yep. that, that they've been working with. Like, you know, like you know, Johnson and Johnson, Coca-Cola. You know, um, you know, Clear Channel. They did some outdoor stuff with. I mean, uh, these guys have been at it for a while, and they're bringing NFC in a non-payments, uh, yep. you know, a primarily non-payments framework. Yep. Uh, you know, into products and into interactions with, you know, digital signage and out-of-home stuff and, you know, all kinds of different applications. And I, and I agree with you. That's why I like this. It is 100% why I like it. I'm just thinking that, you know, we, we talk a lot about image recognition. 
Um, when it when it gets that seamless, uh, this kind of stuff becomes pedantic, right? It's just not something that you, you need to do. But uh, I guess in the interim, you got to make a living somehow. And these guys helped launch Halo Four in in Australia as a result of this, and and it seemed to be too it seemed to do very well for them. So you can't you can't knock it. Um, I think you know what the problem is, Asif, is that I expect so much. I expect so much innovation, every, you know, in this industry. And, and I get disappointed when I see, you know, um, simple uses of this kind of technology. But I, I also forget that we're just at the fringe. So, uh, you know, yep. we're just entering mainstream. Simple is just, just work. Sim simple is so. good. Just look at me. Simple. Simple, simple guy. All right. Those are the uh, three, you know, two, two funding stories, one acquisition. We missed yours. That's your fault. Man, I'm not going to say it again. If you have been funded and you want a little bit of uh, promotion, you want us to talk about you in a good way, uh, slip us a couple of bucks and let us know that you've been funded. We will promote, you don't have to slip us any bucks. We will promote you. We will let everybody know about your funding. So reach out at uh, rob at untether.tv or see at the lbma.com. Please do so anytime and we will let everybody know. Last piece of business before Christmas. Before we let these fine people go and uh, have some turkey and some eggnog with some little bit of rum, our resource of the week called I Saw Mommy Googling Santa Claus. Now, it's not dirty. It's not at all. It's not dirty at all. Uh, um, love this. It's an infographic. Uh, you can get it uh, on the LBMA site. It was put together by our good friends at RetailCustomerExperience.com. Uh, and there's just a lot of great data in here. So it kind of wraps up, you know, year-end, uh, you know, uh, trending data around uh, shopping, both online and bricks and mortar, and some of the Black Friday uh, and Cyber Monday stuff uh, all rolled in here as well. So, yeah, you know, just to highlight a few things, 52% of consumers will shop online uh, this holiday season, up from 40, 47% last year. Um, you know, do you have a favorite stat in here, Rob? I definitely do. I, you know, for me, it was the... Um the mobile side, right? 64% of tablet owners, 64% uh, of tablet owners plan to use them to research and purchase holiday gifts. Smartphones are 53%. You see the difference between, you know, I've always thought of the tablet as a as a commerce vehicle. This kind of confirms that saying that 30% of, uh, of the tablets are used to make a purchase versus 15% of the smartphone. So I think that when you have, um, when you have this kind of stuff that's popping around, um, these kind of statistics, they just reinforce everything that we know. The other side was the uh, the Cyber Monday uh, that, you know, that they talked about. It is it's clearly it's iOS as a dominant, um, you know, when it comes to mobile platforms for for uh, for transactions, iPhone did 4.1% uh, and iPad did 33 and Android total did 32 But this is, yeah, this is, it's a very rich, very, very, very yeah. rich piece. I mean, there's even some numbers here right in the middle of the infographic. Um, they've got 56% of consumers are likely to participate in showrooming. Mm -hmm. 27% would likely make the purchase online using their smartphone or tablet while they're still in the store. So, I mean, that, that's some that's some pretty uh, pretty strong data there. So, a lot of great stats in here. Uh, take a look at it, um, you know, and, uh, you know, if you're in the retail sector, this is something you should be looking at. Absolutely. So, go to uh, thelbma.com forward slash research. It is literally called I Saw Mommy Googling Santa Claus. And that's our resource of the week. Did you see Google's uh, little uh, fight against NORAD there? Did you see their 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 uh, countdown yeah. to uh, Santa Claus? Yeah. yeah. These guys, a lot of money. I love it. <laughs> we spent hours on it yesterday. That's how productive yeah. I've been. I mean, they, they they do some fantastic stuff around that. And I mean, I mean, the one thing I love about Google is, is you know, they, they they might not get social, but they can they can have fun. Well, and and they have some uh, of the world's most talented engineers that are putting together some of this, and they're just showing what these platforms can do. I mean, this was if you haven't seen it, yeah, I mean, go to go to Google.com. You'll see there's a link right off the front page, and and what they've done is they've created this you know Santa's workshop. And it, it's all done without Flash. It's all HTML. It's divs, CSS. It's all that kind of stuff. But it's it's accessible across the board. And and um, it just you know, like they inspire people. And I think that that's what's important, uh, you know, to be doing as a as a company like like Google does. So we've we've exhausted ourselves. We've we've exhausted you guys out there. Um, and that's the show. Just want to say once again, Merry Christmas. I, I, you know, uh, this is uh, this is the time to go and relax and recharge and come up with innovative ideas. And I hope you do that. But don't forget to tune in to our next show on uh, New Year's Eve. You don't have to listen to it on New Year's Eve. Uh, about predictions. What's going to happen? What we think is going to happen in the next year? What happened this year and what we were really, really impressed with and some of the companies that we like. 
yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone out there um, that uh, follows, listens, uh, supports the Location-Based Marketing Association for much to you. Have, have a happy and safe holiday. Yes. All right, Asif, on to you as well, buddy. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. And uh, I can't wait to do the prediction show next week. Yeah. All right, everybody. Looking forward to it. Cheers. See you later, everybody. Yeah.